Hi guys, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. I just want to share a scripture with you guys. First, I want to thank you for being subscribers to my channel. I also want to thank you for those who share my content on your platforms or on your, your Facebook or whatever uh, platform you have. Thank you for that. Thank you for those of you that reach out to me. And so guys, I just want to get right into something that I was reading today. I've read it before, but it's so profound to read it again. Guys, you have to understand the Bible is not a book that you read one time and forget it. You know, one thing about me, I've been an avid reader throughout my life from I was um, young. I want to say from around maybe junior high school. I just remember mostly in high school, though. No, I think mostly starting in junior high is when I would go to the library and I will just check out a bunch of books and I could just go through those books. I loved reading. I loved just going into another world and reading about characters. But one thing I noticed is once I've read a book, it's kind of hard for me to read it again. There might be one or two exceptions, but for the most part, I can't read a book a second time. And guys, you have to realize with the Bible, it's not a book that you can just be like, okay, I read it. <laughs> Every time you read the word of God, which is what makes it so different, you discover something new. Something new will be revealed to you. The word of God has power. The word of God, according to Hebrews 4 and 12, says the word of God is quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So it is real. So I want to read to you Ezekiel chapter 33. And it says this. Hmm, where do I start? Let me start at 12. It says, Therefore, son of, son of man, say to the children of the people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him. You hear that? The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. So in other words, what that saying to us is our righteousness is not going to deliver us when we decide to turn away from God. There's not a book of tallying and, OK, you can go over here and sin because you've been so righteous. You know, when you transgress and turn away, your righteousness is going to hold you down. And the same thing when a person who has been a sinner, which this really makes a lot of people upset, right? Because when the wicked person turns away from his sin, what does it say? Neither shall the righteous be able to live in his righteousness in the day that he sins. So meaning he will not fall. I'm sorry, I just added something. When the wickedness turns away, when the wicked turns away from his sin, he's not going to fall. He's not going to get, meaning what was coming his way, the destruction and death that was sure to be his um, reward will not happen. Basically, all that he's done, it's forgotten. And doesn't that make a lot of people upset? Now, understand what that means is, it does not mean that perhaps that person will not still face some consequences or some repercussions for what they have done, but whereas that person was on the path to eternal damnation, once that person turns away from the Father, turns away, I'm sorry, once that person turns away from their sins and turns back to God, their their path to certain death and, and and eternal damnation will be no more. However, for example, if that person used to steal, there may be consequences still for that. You know, we can't commit crimes and then we ask God to forgive us and then think nothing's going to happen. No, you will still face the consequences for what you have done. 
the Lord may just allow the judge to give you a lighter sentence than what you would have received. But sure enough, you turn away from your sin and turn away from that life you were living, that that path that you were on to hell and eternal damnation, that is going to be no more. All right. So that's what that means. So the righteousness of the righteous will not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, they shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. And it says, neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. 13 says, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust, I'm sorry, when I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. You hear that? When the Lord say to the righteous that he shall surely live, so as I understand that to mean if we're walking up rightly before the Lord and doing his will and we have the promise of everlasting life as the Lord does give to us to enter into everlasting life, to be with him and to live with him forever, you know, once we once we see him face to face, if he trusts to his own righteousness. And commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he has committed, he shall die for it. A lot of times, there are lots of Christians, people who say they're believers, they're trusting in their righteousness. They're trusting in the right things that they've been doing. And... Sometimes what that does, it causes them to think that they are entitled or they have a right to mess up because they're looking at these good things that they're doing. And what the Lord wants us to avoid doing is thinking because we are preaching or teaching or doing some good works in the community you're going out and you're witnessing to people that we feel like those things gives us enough backing and enough leverage where we can sin and get away with it. Because there's a lot of people that they're trusting in their own righteousness. And what does that mean? What, what seems to be right to them or that they are on a praise team and on a choir and that they're on the pastor's they're part of the pastor's aid and they're trusting in that they're going to church and they're going to Bible study and that they're preaching and teaching and prophesying. They begin to feel like they can slack off a bit and that they have, you know, they have some points. So, you know, they've got, all right, now I've got uh, uh, 10,000 points. I can afford to, you know, do a couple things. I can tick off a couple things here. I can mess up over here. Because they keep their own tally of, well, I only do this particular sin once a month. I don't do this all the time. Because look at my big board of righteousness. And that's what's going to get a lot of people messed up. Guys, there are tons and tons and tons and millions of people in hell that said that they were Christians. That lived for church. That lived to go to Bible study, that live to go down to the church to do this and were giving things to the poor. They were building up what they want to say, good works, but they were still sinning against God. There are lots of people who feel like they don't need to forgive. They don't need to admit to wrongdoing. They don't need to make things right with people that they have offended. They don't think that they should apologize to their children because they're doing all these great things, quote unquote, righteous things in the community. Because their name is in a kiosk somewhere, because they are being invited on on talk shows, they think that they're they don't need to pay attention to these 
bits of leaven in their lives. And you know, the Bible says a little leaven spoils the whole love. And so it's very important that we are not trusting in our own righteousness or trusting in works. Just a second. I'm back, guys. My reminder went off just now. I have to be somewhere in a bit. So it's so important. It's so very important that we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in um because you're going to church, because you're you have a YouTube channel about God or you have a Facebook platform or because you're posting things and encouraging messages on your wall on Facebook because you are doing certain things. We have to pay attention to the things that God shows us that's not right within ourselves because there will be a lot of people that's going to be so disappointed and we don't want to be one of them that we're standing before God according to Matthew 7 and hearing I never knew you because what those people were saying when they stood before him the Lord Jesus basically it's prophecy and he's saying many will say to me in that day that means he didn't say many has said to me or many did say to me many will say he's talking about us he's talking about the people, us present time and those who have passed and still have to stand before him. That if we, if people who, what he's saying, many, he's talking about current people, current past, present, those who have been gone, who's died already. When we stand before God, there's going to be people that's going to be saying, Lord, didn't we didn't we do what? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we do many wondrous works in your name? Many wondrous works means any and everything that we can possibly be doing, saying that we're representing God. But he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? Because they practice lawlessness. Lawlessness is iniquity. It's transgressions. And so I wanted to talk about that. It says the righteous, the righteousness of the righteous, your good works, our good works is not going to deliver us in the day of our transgressions. Now, let me explain something. It does not mean that you won't make mistakes. Sinning and making mistakes is and recognizing it and turning back to God. And you may even have a phase where you just feel like you're out of it, you know? But nevertheless, you still have it in yourself like God help me or you're just discouraged and God will lift you up. But transgressing is to go back. People that are transgressing, like they turn from God, like they still talk about him. But in their hearts, they are doing something else. These are people that's living a different life or they continue to do something on purpose over and over and over again against God. And they don't want to change. You know, sometimes you can be in a rut where you want to change. You find yourself like you can't stop doing something. And when you want to stop and you can't, it's, that's when you're in a stronghold. And that's when you know you have to hold on to God. You will have to probably fast even if it's, I just told somebody this and I tell you this, sometimes stop trying to do 40 days, 40 nights. Just take it. Hey, I'm going to fast one hour a week. I'm going to do something or one hour a day for a week or one hour a week for 30 days. Just go and pray to God. You do that little bit and that little bit will strengthen you. And then you'll be able to do more if led by God. Because there's a lot of people who fast because they want to feel the hunger and the and the misery and they do all that, but their heart is still hardened against God. They just want to feel better to say, oh, I fasted, but then they don't change. So there's a difference when, when you find yourself wanting to change and you can't. You're in a stronghold and at this point you just have to cry to God and just be consistent in that and he will pull you out he'll deliver you because he knows you really want to but people who transgress are those who turn away from God completely and continue to do things that's 
Re that it's like going against them. Sinning is going against God. They know the truth. They know what's right because they're preaching it on Sundays. They're teaching it. They read it, but they deliberately continue to do wrong things. And the thing about sin is when you sin and do things, it's affecting a whole bunch of other people. So what God is saying here is their righteousness is not going to keep them from being held accountable and getting the fallout from being wicked and evil and doing what's wrong. So 13 says, I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live. But it says, when I say to the righteous, he shall surely live. If, if he trusts in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he has committed, he will die for it. You hear that? And he's saying, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if he turns from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again what he has robbed and walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Now, no one is perfect, but to deliberately live to do things, to call, oh, I'm not perfect, is what God is saying. It is impossible that you and I would never do something wrong. But as the Lord transforms you, there are certain things you are not going to do anymore. You're just not going to do it because God is going to change you. You may have a wrong thought, but then you immediately get convicted. You know it's wrong. You ask the Lord to forgive you and to take that thought away from you. But people who are truly following God, there's no way you can keep doing the same things. Understood. We talk about strongholds, right? And there is a, you have to get in your mind. I've got to get before God. I want him to help me and he will help you. But people who have been, they have been saved forever and saying that they're, they're, they know the Lord and continue to do certain things. Uh-uh. No. Okay, so the thing with the wicked, what God expects us to do, because we've all been wicked, is we were doomed to die. We were doomed for eternal damnation. But if we turn from our sins and do what is lawful, okay, if we restore the pledge, that means when God tells you to stop doing certain things, stop doing it. When God tells you, when you turn to him and you ask him to forgive you, and he says, you need to apologize to this person, you need to contact this person, then you obey him. When God says, you need to tell the truth about what you did, because this person's name and reputation is, is tarnished because of what you said and did, you need to obey him. That's a part of it. When God tells you, as you publicly malign this person, now you must publicly apologize. It's not enough to realize you were wrong and then you want to secretly uh, keep things to yourself. I believe it was Peter. It's either Peter or Paul. When the Pharisees embarrassed them and flogged them in public and then threw them in prison and they realized they had made a mistake, the Pharisees wanted to secretly uh, release them. But the, the disciples said, I forgot, Peter or Paul, he said, no, the same way that they publicly humiliated us and flogged us, they must also publicly uh, repent for what they did to us, publicly apologize, let people know. And in some cases, guys, not all, the Lord may require that of you. There's some of you, you may have had a platform and you said some things about someone. And now your life has been turned around. God, is, you have repented. There may be things that you need to fix. You may need to apologize to your ex-husband or wife. You may need to apologize to your wife or your husband. The Lord may say, you need to make this right with your children. You need to apologize to your supervisor for how you behaved. Yes, he or she was wrong for what they said. But you as a child of God, you were wrong for how you responded. He may tell you something like that. So once... We turn from our wicked ways and we again restore the pledge and give again what has been robbed. You see, that's the part of what people don't understand, that there may be cases. It's not a matter of you just getting forgiveness from God, but 
listening to his voice when he tells you, you need to fix this. You need to fix that. Stop seeing that man. Stop seeing that woman. Pay back what you owe. You know, all those things. That's a part of repentance. Because there can there is not enough just to say you're sorry to God behind closed doors. Yes, he accepts that. But sometimes there, there are things that you must correct. In addition to that, walking in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, that means we're gonna we still have life and we're still gonna be living. But it is possible through God that you are not going to be an habitual sinner. I'm not saying it's okay that you sin quarterly. But when God changes you and he changes your heart, you're going to be aware of the second you did something wrong. And not only that, you will overcome those behaviors and those habits. You're not going to stay the same. Okay, and when you do that, none of the sins that you've been for, that you've committed is will be mentioned unto you. That's what it says in sixteen. None of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned unto him. He has done that which is lawful and right, and he shall surely live. And what does he say in verse seventeen? Yet the children of your people say, "The way of the Lord is not equal." <laughs> well, God said, "But as for them, their way is not equal." You see, people don't think that's fair. God, you mean to tell me that if I've been serving you all my life and doing all this, if I, if I make a mistake, you're going to just drop me off like that? No, not if you make a mistake. The difference is if you transgress against God, look up the word transgress. T-R-A-N-G-R-E-S-S -S and see what that means. That's not fair, God. You mean this person has been out there being a tyrant all their life and they just come and ask you to forgive them and it's all done and over with? That's what a lot of people do. And that's why, guys, sometimes even when we have turned away from things, there are people that will still remind you of it and still tell you you are nothing and still make you feel and they'll throw it in your face. But I want you to understand, every time someone throws your sin in your face, they, they might as well put a millstone around their neck and throw themselves in the bottom of the ocean. Because God says, woe to those by whom the offense comes that causes my little ones to stumble. And sometimes, you know, you may not necessarily cause a person to stumble from God, but they are hurting and they feel ashamed again. And sometimes that person spirals back into things and struggles and it is, a, it is a stumbling block when someone tries to throw out your sin. Oh, you think you're all that? They see you walking upright, so they put their foot out there to trip you up so you can remember that you used to be a low-down, dirty sinner. Get down on that ground where you belong. That's how they are. So people get mad at that. There are people that's probably mad at me, right? People mad at you. They think of, oh, what we used to do now we're here talking about this and that. Oh, you're talking about righteousness you used to be unrighteous. You're here talking about holiness you used to be so foul. You're over here talking about uh, teaching about, uh, you're over here teaching about celibacy and keeping yourself when you used to be out there. You're over here talking about being a peaceful man and you used to be a man that used to beat up everybody and fight everybody. You used to be beating up your children. You see those things, you, you may hear that again, but God says when he has forgiven you, it's done and over with, but people will think it's not right. And that's why sometimes when you go into ministries and not even necessarily just in a church, but other believers, when they know something about you, when God is getting ready to use you, they'll remind you. Oh, no, I don't think God's going to use you here because, you know, you used to be like this. I don't think God will launch you out this fast because, you know, you've had a life of a hot mess. But if I read the word of God clearly, I don't remember when Jesus saved anyone. He told him, you need to just, you know, uh, I need to see how you are before I use you. He used people. The only time they had to wait was when the Holy Spirit was going to fall down on them. He was going to send the comforter and there was a time frame that he was coming and they needed to be in a position of waiting for the Holy Spirit, which happened in, I believe it's chapter Acts 1 or 2. Okay? So when you've been forgiven for your sins, you've been forgiven. 
I need to say that to somebody. Regardless of who brings it up, you've been forgiven. Who are you going to believe? The person that's bringing up your past or the God who has forgiven you for it? So, and the other thing I want to say is, as believers, all of us, we have to be very careful that even though we're doing the things that God has told us, you know, we're doing righteous things, we cannot trust in our righteousness, meaning trust in, oh, you know, I don't curse and I haven't fallen into fornication or adultery in a long time and I don't do this and I don't do that. We have to look to God who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He, that means from the beginning to the end, he is with us. Okay. And we can't get to a point where we, we are looking at ourselves and we're so much better than other people. All right. And we cannot keep a book of our righteous books of goodness. And so we think, all right, well, you know, I can, I can afford to step out a little bit on God because look at this, you know, my tally is way up. Look at, look at my pie charts of goodness. <laughs> you know, so people have their pie charts up, you know, yeah, I've done a lot of things here. I have a, been prophesying, you know, I've gone over to the camps of Kim. I went over to Cambodia and knitted some socks for the children there. And, you know, everyone came to Jesus. I went to this great big arena and people just turned to Jesus. That has nothing to do with you. People are not coming there to be saved by you. It's because of his power working through you. And so that's how a lot of people get jacked up because they have their pie charts and they've got their 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 line graphs of goodness, okay? And they've got their, their little, yeah, uh, all the stuff going on and all their their analytics of what they what they've done and they and they trust in their righteousness. Uh-huh. And then now what happens? They think they can go and sin. This also debunks the once saved, always saved thing. All right. God is not telling you that, oh, well, I've saved you once and for all. So just go out there and and just have a good time. If you transgress against God, it is going to lead to spiritual and eternal death. God is not going to remember that good stuff you did when you transgressed against him. God is not going to remember that. It's not that he forgot. That doesn't count. Oh, Lord, people came to you when I prophesied in my name. You was using stuff in my name. It was by my power that, that people, those people turned to me, not by you. Lord, I was singing every, every week. Your voice, all that singing, the atmosphere that I gave you to allow those molecules in the air to cause your voice to travel into the ear and hearts of others, that was my doing. Next. Oh, Lord, I prophesied those were, that was by my power, my word, my stuff. Next. Oh, Lord, I, I brought clothes to the homeless. Uh, I provided the money for you to be able to do that. Next. Anybody could have done that. Even Satanists can donate. Next. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? So, guys, we have to be careful. Our righteousness is not what's going to bring us into heaven. It's not that. It's not our, our, the things that we're doing while it is good that you are, we are doing things and we are doing the works of God. These, this is a portion of it, but you have to understand with or without you, that stuff's going to happen. God doesn't need you for that because his, what our gifts and our talents and abilities, as I've said, those things are going to operate and be good because what God gives us is good. It's excellent. It's going to do what it's supposed to do, but that still has nothing to do with you. That's why there's people who have died and they're gone and we can still listen to their music. We can still look at the things that they have created. We can still enjoy the things that they, they introduced via technology. They're gone. We're still enjoying it and they're in the ground. Why? Because their sin, because their gifts are going to continue and it's going to work right whether they're here or not and anyone could have easily done what they've done god just gave them the ability to probably be the first one to introduce it to humanity but those things and their abilities and their knowledge and skills that belong to god so no one can stand before god and talk about what they did and who they donated to because everything belongs to god Everything belongs to him. There's nothing that we can do and say that's going to just be like, oh, yeah, you know what? You're right. Let me let you in. 
Let me let you in, Slider Joe. You's always sliding into someone's DM, sliding into someone's back door, sliding into someone's uh, mind with your your word. Let me let me let you in, uh, Greasy Betty. You know, you 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 are always being shady and doing all these different things. But let me look away from you because you are such a a wonderful person. You're doing so much in your community in my name. Let me tell you about something in your name. There's a lot of people that buy things and purchase things and open accounts in our name that now we upset about it. Open up credit in your name. You were not there. Got credit cards in your name. Purchase things in your name. Well, you know, we get the letter in the mail later on. Using your social you had nothing, knew nothing about it, right? So guys, I just want to talk with you and, and let you understand that our righteousness and good works is not what's going to bring you before God and bring you into eternal life. And we should never trust in our righteousness. But that we are not committing iniquity, that we are not transgressing against God on purpose deliberately you know when we're doing wrong and if we're we're going in a wrong direction god always warns us we get that mm, what are you doing you know what i'm saying but the more we practice doing little things the less we're going to hear god and the easier it's going to be for us to do it it's kind of like exercise when you first start exercising it feels horrible like oh my gosh trying to run for 10 minutes seems like 10 hours but, and you may stop, you can't get it right. But as you continue to work out 10 minutes, you're going to get to it a lot faster. And before you know, you'll be like, oh, it's already 10 minutes. That's how sin is. That's how separation from God is. When you find that you can just do things really easy and it's not affecting you anymore and you're not thinking, it's because you're creating a gap between you and God. It's like creating a gap between... You, if you're by a fireplace, you'll feel it. But the further out you go, you don't feel it as much. Before you know it, you're just cold and you're all wrapped up. <laughs> and next you know, you're frozen. That's what separation from God is. So guys, I'm going to stop here. This message went way longer than I intended. But I think it's important that we remember and know that what's important, what is very important here, guys, is our relationship with God as far as uh our heart our little things that we may be struggling with little habits that you have god is going to be dealing with you with who you need to forgive he's going to be showing you sometimes your motive and your intentions and the things that you do he's going to be telling you about that thing you need to resolve that door you need to close that's what's going to matter so there is no way that we're going to be able to try to get to highlight oh all oh, the great things we're doing because God reads the fine print. All right, guys.